Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Jonathan Schaefer, the Dean of Science, will take us through artificial intelligence and games. Take it away. Thanks. Thank you. And I don't need a mic, if that's OK. No problem. Good. Thank you very much for coming. We have a small, intimate audience. Um, what I want to do today, um, it's very just there. Talk about my passion, artificial intelligence and games. Let me give you a little bit of background first of all. Um, here are the objectives for today. I want to give you a gentle introduction to artificial intelligence so that you can get some perspective on it. I want to talk about games, my, my love and, and what I do with it in artificial intelligence research. Talk about the artificial intelligence successes that we've had to date talk about some of the applications that might be of interest to you that are going to be widely deployed. So I've been here 30 years, pretty scary to think about it, but I've been doing games for the last 30 years. When I was an undergraduate student, uh, I became fascinated with the idea of having computers do intelligent things. I mean, things that I could do really easily seemed extraordinarily complex for a computer, so that was just a challenge. How could I make computers do intelligent things? And because I love playing games, it was natural to say, well, could I build computers that play games as well as I did? And of course, as well as I did wasn't good enough. Had to take the next step further, build programs that were better than any humans at games. Or even one step further than that, build programs that played games perfectly. So I have effectively the world's greatest job because I get to play games all day. The government gives me lots of research money to do that. And I get all the best graduate students and undergraduate students because they all want to work on computer games. So if ever you come into my office and you see me playing a game, it's, it's research, of course. It's always research. At least that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And so um, I could also say that as Dean of Science, I'm now playing the most um, difficult game I've ever played. Uh, I've been thinking about ways to program it. Um, artificial intelligence won't solve this game. It's called the political game. You've got adversaries, uh, university, government, they're adversaries. It's a zero-sum game. The rules keep changing. Uh, they, um, there's a lot of deception going on. It's almost like poker, uh, but it's high stakes with real money. And so there's a game I haven't solved yet, but I'm working on it. So I've been working in games for the past 30 years. I built what we call the Games Research Group here at the University of Alberta, and it does only artificial intelligence into games, applied to games. We do not do research into games. We do research into artificial intelligence. We use games as our experimental test bed. When I was a graduate student, people said, don't work on games, it's a waste of time. Do something important. Use, use artificial intelligence to um, write a program to be judge and jury, or to be a medical doctor, or to be a politician, or something. Maybe the politician wasn't in the important category, but you can see that there are things that you could imagine as real world. But I wanted to have fun doing my research, so I chose games. I started off with the classic games like chess. Chess was the game I started with, checkers, poker, games like that. And about 15 years ago, we branched off into the commercial games. Um, uh, working with electronic arts and bioware. Let me put something in perspective if ever you're thinking about money, because money's always important. When I worked on my chess program, which was one of the best in the 1980s, the only person who played it was me. I had an audience of one. I played it, I tested it, and it would compete in world championships. This is pre-internet. Then I developed the world's best checker program, and uh, that overlapped with the dawn of the internet era, so we ended up putting it on, on the web, and we would get hundreds of people a day playing it. Hundreds, not bad. Then we worked on poker, and uh, did some groundbreaking research, research there, and commercialized it, so not only would people play the program, we actually got money back that went into my pocket, which was very nice. Um, but there, tens of thousands of people bought our, our program. So we've gone up another a few orders of magnitude. And then we started working with BioWare and developed technology that is integrated into their games. 
And those games sell millions of copies. Now, I'm not claiming that the technology we developed led to BioWare selling millions of copies. I suspect they would have sold millions of copies without our technology. But still, it shows the perspective of as you move up this ladder and, and work on different games, I've gone literally from one person playing a game to millions of people seeing the technology deployed. So as I said, I have the world's greatest job. I get to play games. Sometimes I make money from it. And we all have an awful lot of fun. OK, so I'm interested in artificial intelligence. What is AI? Depends upon your definition. It's very strange if you go into a conversation and you say that you work in AI. When computer scientists are around, they always use acronyms. And so AI is what they say. And uh, maybe we're not the most so socially adept uh, because when we talk about AI, we often get unusual looks. It could be Amnesty International or artificial insemination. That doesn't work very well when you've got people from the Faculty of Agriculture in the room. They look at you very strange. Uh, Army intelligence, that's one of those oxymorons. Uh, Air India. Anyway, it turns out AI is a legal word. It's the, it describes a three-toed sloth from South America. There's a cute picture of it. But in my area, it's artificial intelligence, and that's what I mean by AI. So this is all about uh, the field of computing science, concerned with making computers do intelligent tasks, the things that you and I do and take for granted. I want a computer to be able to do them. But when you start thinking about what you and I do, it's amazing. Because look at what I'm doing right now. I'm talking to you. I'm making up words. I'm forming sentences. Presumably, I'm putting them together in some sort of coherent fashion because I think you're understanding what I'm saying. I'm moving my hands around. I am looking at you. Do you know the amount of information that my eyes are processing? I'm looking at this room, the lights, the desks, the chairs, the people, the cameras, whatever. And in real time, instantaneously, I'm absorbing all that information and I'm categorizing it. That is a chair. That is a desk. That is a person. Those are glasses. It's absolutely amazing. And we don't even think anything of it, but it happens instantly. When you look at what the human mind is capable of doing, it is mind-boggling. And the speed at which it can get done is absolutely incredible. So if you're trying to build machines that can do what humans can do, you have a tough act to follow. Mother Nature has done an amazing job of building us. So we are part of a really profound time in the history of mankind, humankind. There's a computer revolution going on, but what I really see is a computer evolution. Because we think of intelligence as something uniquely human. And yet what the computer is forcing us to do is rethink what it means to think. It's the year 2014. You probably don't remember it, but if we go back 14 years ago to, to the year 2000, that was a magical time. 2000, like that was the end of the year. 1999 was about to end and we were going to get the year 2000. It was the end of the, a decade, the 1990s. It was the end of a century, the 1900s. It was the end of an era, 10,000 year period, a thousand year period, sorry. And at that time, if you ever looked at the newspapers, they had all these incredible lists, you know. Oh, in this last century, what were the greatest scientific achievements? Or what were the greatest news stories? Or who were the biggest celebrities? And all sorts of silly things. But when they talked about science, and they talked about the biggest contributions of the 20th century, they talked about, well, the invention of airplanes, going to the moon, uh, refrigeration was big, uh, cars. I mean, we can go on and on, the cell phone, the computer. All these things were absolutely amazing scientific accomplishments. But they missed what I believe is the most profound contribution of the 20th century. It's the realization that intelligent behavior, something we consider uniquely human or something that is a part of life, it can be achieved 
using non-human information processing architectures. This thing isn't alive. My cell phone. There's a silicon chip in here. It's rock. That's all it is. And there's electrons pulsating through the rock. It's silicon. That's it. And yet this black box can do amazing things. Things that you and I think are intelligent. But it's not alive. So imagine going back into time. Let's go back 100 years. Let's say 100 years. No computers then. Probably uh, the car has just been invented. The Wright brothers have just uh, invented flying. You're going to school. It's probably one of those small little brick schoolhouses with one teacher at the front of the room who teaches every grade. You're doing your assignments on a piece of paper with a pencil, right? What if I walked into that room, that pioneer village life of a hundred years ago, and I said, I've got a black box, and this black box is going to take the essays that you're laboriously writing by hand, and it's going to fix all your spelling and grammar errors. You would be shocked, because that's intelligent. Today we, we take it for granted, right? Computers fix spelling errors all the time. And actually, with autocorrect, it actually introduces more spelling errors than it corrects, right? But things that require intelligence, or that we think uh, require intelligence, are now routinely done by computers. What if you go back only 50 years ago, 1960, and you got on an airplane, and the airplane flies by itself. It's got an autopilot. That's amazing. An airplane can fly by itself. They can take off and they can land by themselves. Usually the pilot is there to make sure everything's okay. But it's absolutely incredible to think that a computer can do something as complicated as that, something that we think humans have to do. The point I'm trying to make is that we made enormous strides and a lot of what we call artificial intelligence, you just take for granted. It's not artificial intelligence anymore. The fact that you have a spell check on your laptop, that's artificial intelligence. But it's so commonplace we ignore it. The interesting thing is the more we understand about what computers can do, the less mystery there is about the human brain. And the less we think about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence used to be this big, hairy monster that we had to solve. And slowly we've been chipping away at it because well, there's spelling correction. Well, now that we know how to do it, it's not really artificial intelligence anymore. Or flying an airplane. Well, now that we know how to do it, it's not really artificial intelligence anymore because we know how to do it. So artificial intelligence is this shrinking field of endeavor, which is the set of things that we don't know yet how to do well in a computer. And that set of things gets smaller and smaller over time as we figure out how to do more and more. And what's scary is that a lot of the things that you and I think are intelligent can be done in ways that you and I think are pretty darn stupid. So let me elaborate on that. If you want to build, if you want to do something intelligent, we have two different architectures for intelligence. The one on my, la uh, my uh, right, the human brain was evolved by nature. It's a very clever architecture. But the other one is a computer created by man. And these two architectures of intelligence are capable of doing amazing things. But it shouldn't surprise you that these architectures, because they're so different, a brain has neurons and synapses, a uh, computer has gates and capacitors and wires that they come up with completely different ways to solve a problem. So humans seem to be very good at reasoning in the abstract, asking the who, what, where, when, why, how type of questions and answering them. Whereas computers seem to be very good at mathematics and uh, repeating things. So let me give you an example of this. 
Humans are very good at learning. They're very good at language. Guess what? Computers are very bad at learning, very bad at language. But let's look at computers. Computers are very good at doing mathematical calculation. Compute a third order partial differential equation to 64 digit of, digits of accuracy. Bang, it'll give you the answer. Can you do that? Probably not, certainly not in your head. But they're also good at doing repetitious tasks. Because if I tell the computer to say, do this a billion times, no, do it a trillion times, the computer will happily say, sure, I'll do this task a trillion times. It doesn't get bored. You try doing something a trillion times, it doesn't work. And so what we found is that where humans are very good, computers are weak. And where computers are very strong in their abilities, humans are weak. They're almost complementary to each other. And so it's not a surprise we've got these different architectures, the brain, the computer. They have strengths, they have weaknesses, and the two are almost complementary. Where that is interesting is if I give you a problem to solve on a computer, you're not going to play to the weaknesses of the computer, you're going to play to the strengths. So when you look underneath the hood of a computer, you might see what you think is a really smart program. Hey, it plays superhuman chess. Chess surely is a game that we ascribe to intelligent behavior. How could anything that was dumb play chess better than any human? But the interesting thing is when you look inside and you see how the computer does it, you may think it's stupid. And maybe by your standards it is stupid but it works. And so smart programs may do things in dumb ways. And to some people that's a paradox. How can you do intelligent things while, while being dumb? But it's not really a paradox. What it really gets to the heart of the matter is what is intelligence? So let me show you an example. Uh, this is a famous example, chess, man versus machine. I guess maybe this, you, you're too young to know this, 1997, the famous Kasparov versus Deep Blue match. Um, I was there at the match, so I was there and witnessed this video clip that I'm, I'm about to show you. Uh, at one point during the video clip, you're going to see the camera pan over to a table where you're going to see five or six people. Um, and I'm going to point one of them out and we'll talk about that person a, a little bit later. Uh, in 1997, uh, uh, the world chess champion Garry Kasparov played uh, IBM's uh, Deep Blue Chess Machine. Uh, Kasparov was the world champion. Um, uh, Kasparov lost the match to Deep Blue and uh, went down uh, in history as the first human to lose uh, at chess uh, a world caliber match. Um, some people say, well, now Deep Blue is the world champion. No, Deep Blue did not earn the right to play for the world championship. Uh, Gary Kasparov was enticed to play the match for a million dollars. He did not take it seriously, and he did some stupid things, and he lost. Here you're going to see the end of the last game of the match. Uh, little preface of this, just so that you understand what happened. The first game was a, a draw until Deep Blue encountered a bug and then made a stupid move and lost. The second game, Deep Blue played brilliantly. Gary Kasparov made a mistake in a drawn position and lost. Games three, four, five were draws. And in the last game of the match, game six, Kasparov self-destructed and lost the match. In this, he's going to talk about game two in which he missed a draw and he lost. So you're going to watch him at the end of game six when he loses the game and the match. And then you're going to see him at the press conference uh, and his reaction. Here. As long as I could keep under pressure, you know, forget the end of today's game. I mean, Deep Blue hasn't won a single game out of five because, again, game two I resigned when I was forced to draw. Now, forced that draw. Now, if somebody has another opinion, stand up and tell that the position was not a draw. Game two was resigned in a completely drawing position. Is it a correct statement? No, is it a correct no, this one? No, is it this person is it a correct statement, Mr. Benjamin? Game two. Final position was draw. Now, very important. Now, it was recognized that Deep Blue made a bad mistake in a completely only traditional position, blunder a perpetual check. So this was just a really embarrassing moment because 
Kasparov self-destructed and destroyed himself and lost embarrassingly in game six. And then he's disparaging Deep Blue. You didn't really win game two. It should have been a draw. And I played stupidly today, and so I normally wouldn't have lost, so I should have won the match. Well, it's stupid. You played today, you lost. You played game two, you lost. Game number one, if game number two doesn't count, then game number one shouldn't count, because Deep Blue had a draw until it encountered a bug. You must have had a bug in, in your brain in game, t in game two, because you made a mistake and lost. But he was very, very upset. The reason I pointed out that panel is that uh, the members of the Deep Blue team were there. And the person I pointed out, his name is Marie Campbell, uh, born in Edmonton, did his bachelor's and his master's degree here at the University of Alberta, got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and joined the Deep Blue team and is one of the three co-authors of Deep Blue, arguably one of the major milestones in the history of computer science. But let's take a look at this Kasparov versus Deep Blue. Here's the, the scorecard for the, uh, the big showdown. So in terms of height, uh, Deep Blue um, was very stocky, large, refrigerator-like. Uh, Gary Kasparov was quite uh, athletic. Deep Blue was a little bit taller. Um, Gary Kasparov played tennis every day, and he was quite a svelte, 176 pounds trim. Uh, Deep Blue did not exercise, it just stood there as a big box plugged into the wall and was clearly overweight at 2,400 pounds. Uh, Gary Kasparov was 34 years old. Deep Blue, the computer hardware, the refrigerator, was a half a year old, but the software, the brains of the program, had been evolving for roughly 10 years. D uh, Gary Kasparov had a massive, massive computing advantage because his computer consisted of 50 billion neurons. Now, neurons are computers. They're very small, simple computers, but he had 50 billion of them all working and playing chess. Deep Blue, on the other hand, had 512 computers. Now, these weren't ordinary computers. These were special computers that had been designed only to play chess. Couldn't do anything else except play chess. So Kasparov had a massive computing advantage. Unfortunately, his computers are very slow. So with his 50 billion neurons, he could analyze roughly two chess positions per second. That's typical for a human. Two chess positions per second is about all that we're capable of doing because our brains actually operate quite slowly. Deep Blue, on the other hand, could do 200 million chess positions per second. It could do things at a millionth of a second, where its humans were talking about at a half of a second. Huge computational speed difference. The knowledge that Gary Kasparov had about chess was extensive. He could not do a lot of analysis, but he had a deep understanding of the game, and he could apply that knowledge to each of the two positions he would analyze per second. Deep Blue's knowledge of the game was very primitive. This is the, uh, this, what's called the search knowledge trade-off. Um, Gary Kasparov did very little searching, very little p few positions he would examine, but each of them would have lots of chess knowledge applied to them. Deep Blue would look at millions of positions, hundreds of millions of positions, each of which had very little knowledge applied to them. Both of them had some electrical uh, power sources. The big difference which became very obvious at the press conference is Gary Kasparov has an enormous ego. He doesn't like to lose, not a surprise. Deep Blue, it's just a refrigerator. It has no ego. However, I can tell you that the programmers who designed Deep Blue, they have an ego. So my point here is that different architectures, human brain, computer, different ways of solving the problem, and the end result is they both play very strong chess. Today, computers are so much better than humans at chess. Uh, there are limits to what the human brain can do. Uh, let me give you another example. This one is rather painful for me. Uh, somehow I got interested in doing crossword puzzles, and so I would you know, try and do the New York Times crossword puzzles. And they're the easiest on the Monday, Tuesday. Each day they get harder, and on the weekend they're the hardest. And I can solve the Monday and sometimes the Tuesday. You give me the weekend crossword puzzle, which is really hard. I can fill in maybe 20% of the crossword puzzle, and then I, I'm done. I can't figure out the clues. I feel stupid. 
Um, so Mike Lippman wrote a crossword puzzle solving program. He called it Proverb. First thing he did is he built a database of all the crossword puzzles he could find. New York Times, LA Times, TV Guide, whatever. And when he's trying to solve a crossword puzzle, if it says something like, um, uh, Captain of the Enterprise, as a clue, he would then look in his database and see if that clue was already in the database, and if it was, he would use the answer. And shockingly, 34% um, of the clues and answers in these crossword puzzles, the New York Times crossword puzzles, are repeats from previous puzzles, which means just using an encyclopedic memory, the computer could outperform me. I can get 20% of the puzzle, it instantly fills in about a third of the puzzle just because it's memorized every crossword puzzle that's out there. Um, but the big thing he did is you would have clues that um, you had to figure out what the answer was. But who wants to figure out what a clue means? If you say, what is the capital of Alberta? That's a tough question. You've got to figure out what each of the words is, what it means, look up, figure out what the answer is. What they did instead is just take the questions, the clues, throw them into, into a search engine. What is the capital of, Al of Alberta? And from the puzzle, they know that the answer is eight letters long. And when they start getting top hits, they just look for all the eight-letter words on that page. And lo and behold, Edmonton will show up. And so what he, they did is they said, well, we're going to look at uh, the Internet Movie Database because the clue might have something to do with movies. Or we'll look in a medical database or we'll look in a history database, or a geography database, or a sports database. And so when you say, what is the capital of Alberta? It's going to look up in all of those databases. And it probably will get very few hits in the sports database and the medical database, but it'll get a lot of hits in the geography database, or maybe the history database. And it's looking for eight-letter words. And lo and behold, it'll find Edmonton. And so the scary thing is, this program scores 97% correct on the New York Times crossword puzzle without understanding the clues. I understand the clues, and I can only score 20%. It makes me feel extremely stupid. But we already knew this all along, right? I mean, information retrieval without understanding the information is a powerful technique. What do we do with Google? We just put in a few words and off it goes and it searches and it comes back with the top hit, right? And more often than not, it's right. So, here's an example of how the computer does crossword puzzles. It uses search engines and it uses its memory. I'm not about to memorize all of the crossword puzzles that have been published. The computer can do it. You should see it play Scrabble. My God, oh, I feel so stupid. It has the whole dictionary in its memory, 100,000 words. So it has no problem doing things that I've never, I've, words I've never even seen before. I would never even use. Average human is about 5,000, 4 to 5,000 words in a working vocabulary. Humans, typical human knows about 10,000 words. But there's 100,000 words there, which means there's an incredible number you don't know, and the computer's got it all in its memory. So human, computer, different architectures, different problem-solving methods. methods. So what do I do? What's, what is my definition of artificial intelligence? I am not creating intelligence. What I do is I create the illusion of intelligence. When you look at what I do, memorizing lots of data, sifting through hundreds of millions of pieces of data, I don't think that's intelligent by your standards or mine, but all that matters is the end result. We create the illusion of intelligent behavior. And uh, lest you think that it's all about artificial intelligence, I would like to point out that there is also such a thing as artificial stupidity. Um, some humans, of course, try to create the illusion of intelligence as well. Now, with that introduction to artificial intelligence, let me tell you something about the field of artificial intelligence. I'm going to give you seven categories and tell you a few things about them and what's the state, state of the art in artificial intelligence. Most of this, a lot of this has to do with games, simply because that's my area. 
and games have had a profound impact on the field. So, here, what's the most visible AI? And the answer is computer games. Computer games are a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. They're bigger than the Hollywood industry. You think Hollywood is big, games are bigger. And games are all around creating artificial intelligence. You want to have characters in your games that behave in a realistic manner. You want to have realistic conversations. If you're playing, say, a real-time strategy game, you need the computers to make real-time decisions. You've got to do planning. Computer games have a very large AI component, and they sell. And the games companies will tell you that artificial intelligence is important to creating an engaging game. It's about 10 years old now, but Facade was the first game to really break through, not just on the artificial intelligence side, but on the emotional side. It was done by Mike Mateus, who's now at the University of California in Santa, Santa, Clara, Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, the graphics aren't the greatest, but um, it was the first game which had enough realism that it evoked an emotional response. One of the sort of acid tests for the realism of a game is could a game make you cry? And for some people, Facade was the first game that made them cry. It's a game where you've got a, you are invited to a house with a husband and wife. And as the evening goes on, the conversation back and forth becomes very awkward. And you can see that they're having marital problems and you get stuck in the middle of a very uncomfortable situation. And depending upon your responses, it go, can go off in many different ways. But it hits very close to home for a lot of people, and in the end, it's a very emotional experience because we can all relate to the realism. So that still represent, is, represents a milestone in computer game AI. However, I want to show you that even though there are games with great AI, we still have a long, long way to go. So, let me show you um, a video. This is from a game, Oblivion. And uh, uh, I've got a snippet here that I'd like to show you. And as it goes along, I'll add some annotation. What you're going to see is this person go, sorry, me as the character, I'm going to go into this room. And uh, I'm going to come up with a shopkeeper. And I'm going to try and attract his attention. And I can't do anything. I'm going to throw fireballs and things like this. He's just oblivious to me. Is that AI? I mean, he isn't acting in a reasonable manner. But the moment I touch his feather and take his feather, he's going to react. So you can watch this and tell me how realistic you think this is. Okay, now, I'm going to try and get a reaction out of the shopkeeper. He's there, he's looking at me, let's just see what I try and do and see what kind of reaction I get. Jump on the counter. Kick something. Reaction. Is this artificial intelligent behavior? Now look at those feathers. Somebody help! Come quickly! We've got a burglar! Stop! Thief! Stop right there, 
criminal scum. Nobody breaks the law on my watch. I'm confiscating your stolen goods. Now pay your fine, or it's off to jail. I'm not going to pay the fine, of course. What do you think I am, stupid? Then pay with your blood! Am I supposed to be in prison? My apologies for the violence. What you're going to see is I'm going to run and then I'm going to get trapped at the end and just watch what happens. Watch out! Watch this guy, he just walks in the middle. The knife sword going through him. It didn't come through very well, but hopefully you'll be able to put it on the website and people can see the video. So, what's the most successful AI? In the history of artificial intelligence, uh, when they did a survey about eight years ago, it was uniformly regarded that building strong game playing programs was the biggest success in AI because it was the most visible. A lot of the stuff that happens in artificial intelligence is under the covers, people don't know about it, but in game playing programs they do. And if you don't mind, I'm going to brag about the University of Alberta because we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we built superhuman game playing programs for checkers in 1994. In fact. Our checkers playing program is in the Guinness Book of World Records because we were the first computer program to win a human world championship. In 2007, we solved checkers. We now have a program that plays perfectly checkers. Chess became as good as humans. Uh, computers became as good as humans in 1997, and Murray Campbell from U of A was one of the co-authors. Later that year, the game of Othello was done by Michael Burrow, who's now a faculty member here at University of Alberta. In the late 1990s, Brian Shepard uh, did Scrabble. He was uh, one of my PhD students. Uh, computers are superhuman at Scrabble. Backgammon was done in the early 2000s, uh, superhuman. It was done by Jerry Tesaro of IBM, but it used core technology that was invented by Rich Sutton, who's a University of Alberta faculty member. And uh, since 1994, we've been working on poker, 20 years now, my goodness. Um, and in uh, 2007, we proved that we were superhuman at two-player limit Texas Hold'em poker. Um, looks like we're almost superhuman now at two-player no limit Texas Hold'em poker. And we're pretty strong at three- and four-player poker. So we continue to do games and achieve superhuman performance. Okay, what's the most used artificial intelligence? Without a doubt, the most popular example of artificial intelligence is email spam filters. They learn patterns. You get mail, the stuff that you mark as spam, it, it looks what's in the email message and says, you've told me this is spam and if ever I see it again, I will mark it as spam. So you give it input, what is real, legitimate mail, what is spam, and over time it evolves to a model that reflects what um, you want to see and what you don't want to see. It's not perfect. It's 99 point something percent correct, so you should always periodically check what's in your spam mailbox just to make sure it didn't make a mistake. I find a message or two a month that it, it makes a mistake. It will never be perfect. But it is the most widely deployed AI in the world. Where are the biggest artificial intelligence systems in the world? Uh, credit cards, in particular Visa, has got one of the world's biggest AI systems because it detects potential credit card fraud. So every time you purchase something on your credit card, it remembers it and it detects a pattern. Like Jonathan only buys small things in Edmonton. So if all of a sudden I buy a stereo in New York City, that's odd behavior for me. It will flag it and may not allow the transaction. I mention that because Last year, I got a phone call from Visa saying, did you just buy a stereo in New York City? Uh, and the answer was no, of course. So this happens all the time, and uh, it's now automated. Machine learning is at the heart of all credit card systems. Uh, Walmart was the first uh, major store to use machine learning. They predict buying patterns. Walmart does not want to send extra stock 
to a store. So based on the previous weeks or previous years data, it predicts how much uh, of a particular good will be purchased within the coming week and it ships that many goods to that store. So the store never has an excess of inventory. Their systems have been refined over the years, so their predictions are phenomenally accurate. If you go to a Walmart store, it's very rare that you see that they're sold out. Uh, pretty amazing system. The biggest systems in the world are clearly the US military. Unfortunately, we can't say much about them because the US government does not disclose what most of them do. But some of them are, are obvious. Uh, face recognition systems, the US government has built in enormously sophisticated face recognition systems. Um, wherever you go in any kind of a secure place, uh, whether it be, say, an airport uh, or a government building, there are cameras that are taking pictures of you and going through extensive databases, doing pattern matching and identifying who you are, translating the picture of the face into a name. Uh, missile guidance systems, you know, obviously the U.S. has these uh, sophisticated missiles that you just tell them where to go and they travel through space and land pinpoint on the target. Um, autonomous vehicle navigation, they've developed a series of, of vehicles that can drive by themselves and go through deserts and rocky terrain, etc. It's a lot better to send robots into battle than it is to send humans. And these, at the heart of all this technology is artificial intelligence. Who are the biggest AI investors? The biggest are the search engine companies, Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. At the heart of these search engines is artificial intelligence. It's at the core of the search algorithms. And it's more than just artificial intelligence to do searches, it also includes language translation. And so these search engines do support multiple languages and translation facilities. Microsoft uses AI for their help system and you know, Microsoft has great things about their help system, but I personally think it sucks. Um, I don't know why. Um, I always seem to have trouble whenever I use Microsoft help. It just gives me the wrong answer. And so they tout it as a big triumph from artificial intelligence, and I've never yet seen uh, their system do a good job. But I, maybe it's just me. Another area where you see big investment in AI is on user preference systems. Amazon.com and Netflix are obvious example, examples. You know, every time you buy a book at Amazon, it will suggest similar books. It studies what you buy, what you look at, and then based on that predicts what you might also like. Netflix had a challenge a few years ago for a million dollars. They said, uh, we're going to give you a data set. Users, um, watch these movies predict what movies they're going to watch next. And they set a gold standard. If you could achieve that gold standard, there was a million dollar prize. And it took two years. People were able to develop systems that met the gold standard. And so some researchers got million dollar prizes. And Netflix now uses that technology. I think the best example is Bill Gates. He said, quote, a breakthrough in machine learning would be worth 10 Microsofts. And we're still looking for breakthrough in machine learning. Machine learning is fundamental to a lot of things, but the problem with machine learning is there's no one size fits all. We have this ability to, in our brains to learn almost anything, and reasonably well. In the technology world, there's a dozen different ways to do learning, and the right way really depends upon the problem you're trying to solve. What about some cool AI applications? Uh, search and rescue is a good example. These things already, already exist. A lot of robots were deployed on the September 11th tragedy uh, 13 years ago. Um, these robots could go into the rubble looking for uh, humans at no risk to other humans who ordinarily would have had to go in and search for people. These uh, robots are used all around the world. For example, they're used in Antarctica now to do a lot of the work where it's too dangerous for humans. We have the Mars rover. It's on the planet Mars and you know it takes a long time from a message from the Mars rover to get back to Earth or from a message from Earth to get to the Mars rover. So these things have to have artificial intelligence on them. It's not like the Mars rover can say, oh my goodness, there's a pothole in front of me. What, what am I going to do? And then wait for five minutes for the message to get back to Earth and then wait for five minutes for Earth to come back and say, avoid the pothole, it doesn't work. 
An even more extreme example was Deep Space One, which was a mission launched by NASA. It was the first spacecraft that was controlled by artificial intelligence. Because Deep Space One was going to the outer reaches of space, it was not possible to do this by control from NASA because the time it takes to do a transmission back and forth was so long, it was unrealistic. And this vehicle needed the ability to maneuver on its own without human intervention. Here's one of my favorite examples, and this is a real sore point with me. I hope this comes through clearly. This is work done by Peter Stone, who is a game person. Uh, he's at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, the technology exists today. Um, people won't use it, though. So how often you come to a traffic light, the light is red, you sit there, there's nobody going the other way. You could just go through the intersection just so easily. But you're stuck. It's a red light, you can't go through. So if you take a look here on the left, you see intersection. There's uh, three lanes going each way, so it's a six-lane highway. You can see uh, there's stoplights at the intersection. One direction is going through, they've got a green light. But all other three intersections were, are stopped. Now another way has been enabled with the green light, but you can see the number of vehicles going through is actually relatively small. On the other side of the screen, just to bring home a point, is not a six-lane highway, it's a 12-lane highway. And what this is is a simulation. Each of these cars, the little boxes, have a remote control sensor, which means they can sense what's ahead. And so the car drives through the intersection. You do not have control. The car drives through the intersection automatically. And so because the computer can sense everything that's around it, it just goes through completely safely, no crashes. The fact that the two cars come within about two inches of each other and don't collide is no concern to the computer. It got through safely. If I was a passenger in one of these cars, that might be a different story. But if you take a look here, You can see what happens, there's an, an amazing increase in throughput because there is no notion of a red light. Sometimes you'll see a car slow down because there's no clear way through. And sometimes you'll see some near accidents, but this is all under computer control. And so there's no, it's not possible for there to be an accident. This would be an amazing improvement in productivity because now we would not have to stop for red lights. We would just have the computer control us through. Uh, the reality is there's no reason why this can't be deployed today. It's all human psychology that's preventing that from happening. It does look a bit terrifying, doesn't it? By the way, uh, Google has, uh, you may have heard of their um, self-driving car, which can do this, Google Drive. One of my PhD students now works on that project. so. Last year I had the privilege of going down to Google and going for a ride on a self-driving car. It is absolutely amazing to be sitting in a car and um, uh, there's a laptop in the driver's seat and the laptop takes you out on a highway and you're going 100 kilometers an hour with no driver. It's a very, very strange sensation. Here's another cool application that's serious games. Uh, these are games which have serious implications. So for example, training doctors. I saw a very interesting application a few years ago of a game to train doctors to go to uh, war zones. You're a doctor, you just got your degree, you join the military and they say, okay, you're going to Afghanistan tomorrow. That doesn't prepare you for what the reality is. It's not going to be these beautiful modern hospitals. You might be in Afghanistan on a dirt road, somebody's been shot, there's snipers around, how do you do medical under those conditions? And so these are serious games, immersive games, that try to teach you what it's like with the appropriate sights and sounds. So a huge business these days in creating games that are truly educational. Not in the sense of kids' games that educate, but like professional games that uh, provide you uh, a real-life experience. Uh, airplane. Flight simulators are a good example uh, of that kind of game. Another is home robotics. 
Uh, these are all valid, real products that you can buy today that work uh, impressively well. Uh, again, they haven't caught on. Uh, people are reluctant. <coughs> the most popular brand name is Roomba, and it does do vacuum it's vacuuming. It's kind of weird to see this thing just scooting around vacuuming up randomly. My cat does not like it. Um, there are some issues because Roomba sucks things up, and so uh, a scrap of paper and a, and a hundred dollar bill are just scraps of paper. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. It seems to bump into a lot of things a bit too often, but it works. Um, I like the mowing the lawn one. I don't have one, but I desperately, desperately want one. Um, yeah. When we talk about home robotics, I have to be candid. There are some things that we've been have been portrayed as coming someday soon. They're not here yet. Uh, the kind of things we saw in the Jetsons or Star Wars or even uh, Lost in Space are not going to happen in my lifetime. Maybe they'll happen uh, in yours. When we get into artificial intelligence and computers, we get into ethical issues. Um, David Levy's published a provocative book about love and sex with robots, and he postulates that um, with intelligent robots, um, it, even with computers today, people are, gener are, are building relationships with their computers. It's kind of scary. It's well documented. And when you put those computers inside a physical frame, um, he says that you could have intimate relations with your robot. And, uh, well, it was a bestseller, Love and Sex with Robots. All technical, how to do it. Um, when you talk about robots, you can talk about do robots have rights? If robots are artificially intelligent, what happens when you unplug them? You can kill them. Should you be allowed to do that? Um, so there is essentially uh, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Robots. They've drafted uh, a uh, bill of rights for robots so that at the time when robots become sentient that we treat them with the proper respect that they deserve. And it's coming. Uh, computers is judge and jury. It's already happening and it will happen more and more where a computer program is going to take all input for a particular criminal case and is going to decide whether you're innocent or guilty. Um, I don't think the world is quite ready for that yet, but that kind of technology is not that far off. So what's coming soon? Lots of things. Personalized health care is a big one where um, you have input data from each individual person and uh, the system learns about what works and what does not work for you so that it can give a specialized customized treatments. One size does not fit all. Uh, automated vehicles I briefly mentioned. I guess I should have mentioned that the Google Drive project uh, is now legal to have driverless cars in Florida, Nevada, and uh, California. And Google's record um, driving is now almost a quarter of a million miles without an accident. How many people do you know have driven a quarter of a million miles without an accident? So there's a very strong case to say that we, we should be having self-driving cars. Unfortunately, um, they only work well in idealized California conditions. They have not yet addressed snow and ice, the, the perils of an Edmonton winter. Uh, high quality language translation is happening slowly. We still have problems with it, but uh, you'll see that fairly soon. Lots of non-industrial robots, conversational interfaces, lots of things happening. What are the impediments? Why isn't some of this stuff commonplace? It exists. We could have driverless cars widely used today. We could have intersections which, where the computer takes control of your car and just drives you through the intersection. You don't have to do anything. And the reason we don't is because the public is the bottleneck. We have a problem with public perceptions from the science fiction literature. Everybody knows what happened in the movie 2001. Everybody's seen these movies like iRobot where a robot runs amok and does something bad. And so people are afraid to let technology be in control. The reality is, is that AI is a critical part of our lives right now. It's largely invisible. You have used it multiple times today and you didn't know it. If you 
purchase something on your credit card, you used AI. If you were at Amazon.com, you used AI. Uh, you got your laptops open and you did spell checking, you used AI. I mean, there's so many different applications out there. You're using it every day, many, many times a day, and you don't even know it. And so I like to think Intel was very successful. They had this notion of what they called Intel inside. They'd have these computers and branded that, hey, Intel was inside running your machine. And for me, it's really AI inside. A lot of the things that we take for granted, it's artificial intelligence underneath the covers, behind the scenes that's making it happen. Another impediment is the lack of knowledge in industry. This is new technology. Industry has not yet adapted. One of the sore points with me is that University of Alberta produces many AI graduates each year, and there is very little receptor capacity here in the province of Alberta. Because sadly, this is an oil and gas industry, and they understand oil and gas. They don't understand uh, leading edge technology. Uh, most of these people end up leaving the province and the country to find a job. Uh, Google is the biggest employer of my students, for example. And it's a shame that we train these great Canadians and then they all end up going to California because that's the only place that they can get work. So conclusions. AI is already a major part of your life and you probably didn't even know it. AI will become an even more important part of your life and you probably won't even know it. The takeaway message though is there's a lot of AI technologies that are mature and ready to be deployed. It's just we need an, a willingness of the public, receptor capacity to accept that maybe computers can do a better job than humans. So with that, I'd like to end and open it up for questions. So any questions, you guys? Um, how do you propose to have like the openness of the public? Because I mean, like with AI, do you, like there's usually a downside to it. Um, like for example, in games, people who play it a lot, right? They find out that the AI has a certain pattern, and they they, they, just, they just beat it, and that's it. So how do you like open up the possibilities of AI? Like for cars, I think that's a cool idea, but I just feel like people would be too scared to lose control on how they're driving. So. So, yeah, people are, are scared to lose control, and that's a problem. Um, on the other hand, if I told you that by doing so you could save $10,000 a year, would you do it? You know, the economies of scale for some of this stuff aren't there yet, but they could be there. And then I think the marketplace will, will, will determine. Um, think about a driverless car, for example. If you have driverless cars, nobody has to own a car. I want to go to work, so I'm going to dial in and say, I'd like a car to pick me up at my place at, at 8 o'clock in the morning and take me to the university. A car will arrive, I'll hop in, it'll drive me to the university, I'll get out. University doesn't need parking lots anymore, right? Because people aren't driving to work. The car will then go off and service somebody else. Or it'll go somewhere and sit around until somebody else needs something. I mean. If you think that I don't have to buy insurance and I don't have to buy gas and I don't have to buy repairs and I don't have to buy a car, there's huge economies of scale. And so a lot of this technology is there and it's ready. It's just a matter of educating people and uh, it's going to come because the potential savings, the simplification in our lives is enormous. Um, I've seen the statistics on driverless cars. Um, when you take a look at the human statistics and you look at the driverless car statistics, it's stunning. Because these cars don't get into accidents, right? And so you're talking about people's lives being saved, huge uh, saving in um, medical, uh, insurance, everything. So um, people look at the dark side. They think there's something evil about this. Anything we develop, there's something evil. You can always spin something in a way that, that uh, makes things look bad. When you talk about artificial intelligence, people say, computers are going to take over the world. Well, it's a scenario. Are we going to let it happen? Don't know. Doubt it. But why can't we take a look at technology and say, look what this has the potential to do in terms of our quality of life, right? You know, the very fact that you can have a machine that does your vacuuming, does anybody in this room like to vacuum? Does anybody in this room like to mow their lawn? 
Roomba or iRobot has, has machines that will shovel snow. I don't like shoveling snow, especially when it's minus 20 outside. Um, a lot of this stuff has just enormous implications for our quality of life, and I, for one, want to embrace it. I thought I would address um, just the complexity issue. You said that uh, a lot of AI simplifies complex issues, like the intersection that we looked at, and um, I do agree, but um, do you see the simplification of some things as a downside? Like, it makes our life easier, but sometimes to me, thinking that I don't need to learn grammar or spelling because my computer will just do that. Like, do you see that as a potential downside in some areas? It could be. I mean, we have calculators now, so I would argue that uh, uh, students growing up today can't do add, subtract, multiply, and divide as well as they used to be able to do it in my generation because they're lazy. They'll just type it into a calculator. So, I mean, clearly, technology can make you lazy. On the other hand, um, Maybe it frees up a lot of time so that you can develop other skills and attributes. So it's, it's, not, it's not open and shut. The fact that maybe um, computers would make us worse at our grammar doesn't mean that there isn't compensation by making us better somewhere else. Any other questions? This is the future, and it's coming faster than you think. It's one of the fears people might have like, from movies and stuff, that this AI technology would go bad and uh, turn awry, like, conquer human race, something like that. Um, so like, as of today, like, what kind of error prevention like, coding do we have in this AI technology? Like, say for a driverless car, like, if a pedestrian randomly walked in front of the car, like, how would the car react? Or is the car in uh, like black ice, which it can't really detect? Like, how, how, would, how would we prevent those errors from happening? So um, the, the biggest obstacle right now to driverless cars, uh, besides public perception, is the, are the insurance companies. Because they want to make sure like absolutely every possible scenario is covered, right? And so you're right, there are a lot of special cases that have to be addressed. And that's going to take a long, long time. Um, but it's going to happen, right? I mean, the, these, these, these programs aren't perfect. And over time, they will become perfect. In the short term, though, if you deploy the technology, there'll probably be some mistakes, right? Hey, when they, we started with airplanes, uh, with the Wright brothers, there were a lot of crashes. A lot of people lost their lives, but eventually we figured it out and we got a technology that's almost perfect. Um, I mean, airplanes are pretty reliable, uh, and they're reliable enough that we take them for granted. And driverless cars aren't to that point yet, but they will. And if people accept them, then um, it'll happen much, much quicker. We can either go with the flow and things will happen sooner, or resist it and things will happen slower. Yeah? That's another question. Uh, like currently with AI uh, programming, I'm not that familiar with programming uh, at this point, but uh, do you usually consider all the cases when programming a com computer program, or do you like, try to rely more on machine learning now? So to, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, for some problems, you consider all cases, and you can write the software and make sure that it handles all the cases because you can enumerate all the, the possibilities. For anything that deals with the real world, you can't. And so therefore you need a program that's like us, that's adaptive, right? I mean, we're very good when something happens, we figure out what happened and find a way around it. If you're driving from Edmonton to Red Deer and you discover that the highway is blocked, you just don't stand, stop the car and say, oh, well, I'm going to wait until the highway gets open. You're probably going to go off on a side road and find another, another way around, and you'll just do that as part of your problem solving. And so this is the big thing that with, with computers. You need to use machine learning because in the real world, things arise that you could never have foreseen. And therefore, the, 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 the software has to be robust enough to say there's a problem. How do I get around the problem? And that's... In, in some problem domains, it can be extremely difficult, right? So we're working on it. 
Really quick question. What application of AI are you most interested or looking forward to? Interested by or looking forward to? That I'm looking forward to? I actually enjoy driving, but I hate driving to and from work in traffic. I hate bumper to bumper traffic. I hate sitting at stoplights. I, I would love to have the driverless car. I, 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 I want it. And it could happen, it could happen today. And the driverless car means completely driverless and everybody's driverless, which means I don't have to stop at intersections. It's just exactly like that video. And that would add huge quality to my life. I mean, just imagine I can sit in the car and I can do other things while I go to work, right? Essentially, I'm chauffeured to work every day or wherever I want to go. I can go on a holiday and I can just say, this is where I want to go and it'll just take me there. And it will do so safely. I could read a book if I wanted in the car. Have you seen the ad? Oh, that's loud. Um, have you seen the ad on the internet? Uh, this is a really random tangent, but I saw an ad on the internet a little while ago that was by IBM. I don't know if you've seen it. Just let me know if you have. Uh, it was basically saying that as artificial intelligence progresses, we're going to have intelligent cities. Cities are going to be able to predict where people are going to be. A little bit like what you were talking about, having everyone chauffeured from place to place. It's saying you can have buses that are programmed based on the volume of uh, passengers in a certain area. And I was wondering if you ever see that as like even infinitely possible or if it's just another crazy ad. That so first of all, I don't watch TV, so I haven't seen the it's ad. on the internet. OK, I haven't seen it. Um, but the notion of what are called smart cities is gaining a lot of momentum. Um, there's so much data out there. You know, when you drive on the roads, uh, most cities, including Edmonton, have roads with sensors there so that they can tell what the volume of traffic is. There are apps that you can get that will dynamically reroute you through a city based on real-time traffic data, right? Uh, and are even sophisticated enough to know what the timing of the stoplights are so they can actually do it in ways that will minimize the amount of wait time at stoplights. Um, city of Edmonton is one of the leaders in the smart city movement. There is so much data that they're collecting, and if you actually go to the City of Edmonton page, they'll let you know, uh, what one of the web pages will let you know all the data that's out there, and encur they encourage people to develop apps to use this to improve people's productivity. It's, it's amazing, and traffic is just, is just one example. Um, there's so much that we could do. Another example where it's, um, uh, smart cities is being very useful is, is usage of power. Uh, looking at power pad patterns so that you can uh, redeploy power where, where it's needed in advance of when it's needed and shut it down or lower it in places that where it's not going to be needed. And do this automatically because quite frankly we waste a lot of power. Uh, and there's something where a bit of sophistication leads to large cost savings. And we're all interested in seeing cost savings, right? Lots of potential. Uh, you mentioned um, how, well, you briefly mentioned how uh, Alberta's economy is not tailored to um, investigating these new technologies further. Like, what, what kind of changes do you think um, our economy could go through to sort of incorporate more uh, diversity by um, focusing on technology? Well, now you're branching off into an area where I'm going to get myself in trouble because that's politics. Um, I'll be quite candid. I've been here 30 years. During that time, there's been at least four major government initiatives to, di to diversify the economy. And all of them have failed. 30 years ago, we were a one-trick pony, oil and gas sector. 30 years later, we're a one-trick pony, oil and gas sector. And so, um, so something has gone wrong with all of these government strategies. And uh, I don't understand why they failed. Um, I've never been consulted as to why, what I think should be done in the IT sector, but I would argue that um, maybe these decisions shouldn't be made by politicians, maybe they should be made by people closer to the action who know what's actually going on. You know, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, uh, we're very lucky in this city we have a company called BioWare games company, big games company, or it used to be a big games company. But nobody else is here in the games market. Um, we don't have the right tax incentives, the, the right 
government ecosystem. Vancouver has big subsidies for games companies. Montreal has huge subsidies for games companies. The companies go there like magnets. And you could argue that maybe those kind of subsidies are unfair, but the reality is what it does is bring and attract huge companies to that market and bring talented people. And those talented people work there for a while and then maybe they leave and they do something else like spin off other companies. I was part of an initiative to bring a very large U.S. company to Canada, uh, to Canada for the first time and because of our machine learning group, Edmonton was the obvious place to put them. And this company, I'm not going to say the name, you know the name, um, it would have been huge for Edmonton. Do you think the government would invest one dollar to make that happen? Ontario made it happen. They gave them lease-free land for 20 years and a tax break. And now this big company has a thousand employees in Ontario, three branch sites, and zero people in Alberta. Small branch office now in Vancouver because Vancouver said, we want in on the action. So I would argue that uh, government short-sighted policies have made a huge negative impact. And so I'm just looking at my sector that I know and I understand and I say if this is symptomatic of what's happening elsewhere, it's no wonder we haven't gotten out of this oil and gas rut. And I fear for the economy of this province because if you take a look at the oil and gas sector, it's a roller coaster. It goes up and it goes down, right? And when it goes down, we had our, what, our bitumen bubble last year, right? And we all know what happened to the university. We got devastating cuts last year. And now we're back on the rise again. You can't have an economy that's based on a one commodity price because it's too volatile. Now you know why I'm not a politician. So, you know, we, we've been teaching this course now for three years with uh, high quality uh, video. And I think today <laughs> stands uh, as an interesting high and low watermark in, in, in the following sense. Our, our, our videos have gotten better and better, and I don't know why it happened exactly today, but I think your first few minutes are amongst the strongest that we've ever had. So a lot of people decide about whether they're going to keep watching something from how it starts. I mean, that's just, just the way it is. And you mentioned David Levy, and what you may not know is that I uh, interviewed him in uh, January 2011 with very high hopes that, you know, this would be a fantastic interview. And it is definitely the worst YouTube video that I have. I, I'll, I'll send you that link. So the start of your lecture today was sort of a perfect storm in terms of high quality, and my uh, interview of uh, David Le Levy in January uh, 2011 is at the absolute bottom of <laughs> the other end. So we can reference both the top and you know, the bottom in the same. same. Did, did you talk about love, sex, and robots? <laughs> What he really wanted to talk about, which came as a huge surprise and big downer, was capital punishment, which he strongly believes the UK should have. This would solve everything. I was not enthusiastic about this <laughs> as a subject. Wow. <laughs> For somebody who's so smart, who's one of the, the, the world chess champions and has written an outstanding book, to find that this was really what he really wanted to talk about, this was his message for the world, was extremely disappointing. And, and, and you'll see, everything was wrong. I've talked about timing. I think the timing of the start of your le lecture today was outstanding. The timing of my interaction with uh, Levy is a bit what, what you might want to say, halting, laconic. <laughs> we just so, it, uh, anyway, th thank you very, very much. We're My out pleasure. of time. And uh, thanks for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.